Hi everyone, welcome to the Ethiology podcast with Eric Chopra. Here we talk about everything related to the Indian past. This is the first episode of Ethiashala, that is the House of History. A friend of mine recommended this name while also highlighting my obsessive habit of prefixing the word ethias everywhere. So in this series I will be simplifying topics from Indian history for students learners or anybody who is curious to know more about the Indian past later on I will also be getting scholars and historians on board to discuss with them their areas of specialization and to even answer questions that you may have and on that note I must tell you all that we have a very very exciting guest coming in on the Ethiology podcast next week Now if you want to suggest a topic from Indian history that you want simplified then you can send us an email on ethiasology@gmail.com or send us a direct message on Instagram @ethiasology. Now without any further ado let's begin with today's episode. Today we are investigating how Persian as a language rose to prominence in medieval India and also how did the scribes and munshis who worked for the Mughal empire helped in furthering the popularity of Persian We are focusing primarily on the reign of the third Mughal emperor Akbar during whose rule we witness Persian becoming the language of the administration Now the reason behind Persian emerging as a popular language in the northern parts of India during its medieval phase cannot be wholly attributed to the Mughals as Muzaffar Alam traces its history the introduction of Persian happened as early as the third quarter of the 9th century when Sindh was integrated into the Safavid kingdom the dynasty of greater Iran By the 11th century when Ghaznavid power established itself in Punjab a Persian literary tradition started to thrive there In the late 12th and early 13th centuries Persian reaches Delhi with the Turkish conquests and the sultans that followed in the 14th and 15th centuries were also patrons to Persian poets and scribes When wide-scale migration of Iranians to India occurred during the Mongol invasions of Central Asia, it was the Sultanate that offers a place of refuge and many Iranian scholars and artists settled down in Indian localities and many of these places then begin to be named in Persian. However, a decline in Persian occurred during Afghan rule. Hindi became a semi-official language. Thus the Afghans from whom the Mughals who were Chagatai Turks by origin that is Turki people who were descended from Chagatai Ulus when they took over they were not as fluent in Persian during its early years the Mughal empire preferred language that was Turkish and its founder Babur wrote his memoirs in Turki and this also became the first language of his successor Humayu however When Humayun ascends to the throne there are some conflicts with Afghans which result in Humayun taking refuge at the Safavid kingdom of Iran and during his return to India a retinue of Persian speaking Iranian scholars and artists accompany him during this recovery period of the Mughal empire this is when Humayun comes back and he tries to resettle it is efficient persian accountants who get assigned to organize the finances of the empire given their great knowledge and mastery now over time akbar the son of humayun grows up in a courtly environment where persian is flourishing one of his tutors was mir abd al latif kazvini who taught him the masnavi of mulana rumi this work Masnavi ya Manavi or the spiritual couplets was a very influential Sufi poem written in the 13th century by the Persian poet Jalaluddin Muhammad Rumi Learning this poem resulted in Akbar being greatly appealed by Persian Sufi poetry While growing up Akbar also becomes very fond of Persian epics and stories like the Hamza Nama which was a 9th century Persian epic featuring the hero Amir Hamza Ira Mukoti in her book on Akbar talks about how influenced Akbar was by the story so much so that he would walk around narrating this episode from this epic in this dramatized style of storytellers 
Persian painters too, such as Mulana Yusuf, contributed to the prominence of Persian idioms, in this case visual, and the mystical essences which pervaded Persian art also led to Akbar's reverential view of paintings. Thus, from an early age, Persian idioms, both textual and visual, influence Akbar, under whose rule Persian emerges as the most significant language of the court. Now, as Akbar grows up and takes control of the empire, he becomes very interested in promoting intellectual contacts with other regions, and he wants to promote contacts with Iran. And thus, officials were sent to the region to increase their friendly contacts, Dosti or Shahi, with the Mughal Empire. Iranian scholars and literati were also persuaded to settle in India, and Persian scholars like Chalapi Beg were promoted to the ranks of principal at royal madrasas. For many Iranian scholars, Hindustan then was becoming the abode of peace, Dar al-Aman, and during the 1580s, many Persian intellectuals and poets migrated to Akbar's court, seeking career opportunities. In 1666, the French traveller Jean Chardin wrote, Within this last century, a great many Persians and even entire families have gone and settled in the Indies. Now, Mukoti, in her book, has also quoted this poem which was written as a caustic challenge to Shah Abbas of Persia. This poem expresses the lure of Hindustan and it is as follows. That in Persia, no one comes within sight who is a customer of the commodity of meaning. In Persia, the palate of my soul has become bitter. Go I ought towards Hindustan, like a drop towards the ocean, I may send my commodity to India. Now, under Akbar, the Kitab Khana, the translation bureau. Students take note, while you might think immediately that the Kitab Khan is only a library, in the Mughal context, this is the bureau where works are being translated. So at the Kitab Khana, many works began to be translated into Persian under Akbar. Important titles like the memoirs of his grandfather, Babur, who wrote the Babur Nama, were among the first few works to be translated into Persian. And Akbar's aunt, Gulbadan Begum, made use of Persian to write the Humayu Nama. Persian classics in texts such as the Aklaki Nasiri, which was Abul Fezal, who was one of the most cherished courtiers of Akbar, who goes on to write the Aini Akbari and the Akbar Nama. He was also the Mir Munshi, commander of the secretaries. So for him, Aklaki Nasiri, which was the book of ethics written in Persian in the 13th century, uh, this was made an essential reading, an essential Persian reading by him. And this work began to be copied at the Mughal court and manuscripts from Persia were imported to be decorated at the Tasveer Khana, the Bureau of Figural Paintings. Now, under Akbar, the Translation Bureau also undertakes the task of translating Hindu epics like the Mahabharat and Ramayana into Persian. In 1582, on the translation of Mahabharat, which was to become the Razmanama, the Book of Wars, Abul Fezal commented, it was desired by the minute-loving reason of the king that the Mahabharat, which is replete with most valuable things connected with religion, be translated so that those who display hostility may refrain from doing so and may seek after the truth. Akbar also goes ahead to institute the formal position of the poet laureate at the royal court. He also creates a system of court diarists, the Vakai Navis, who had to accurately preserve the acts and words of the emperor and the events of his reign. Michael Fisher asserts that the court diarists made use of highly ornate Persian language for the emperor and noted those actions that Akbar believed were worthy of being noted. He also patronized Kissa Khans, storytellers, who would dramatically narrate tales in Persian. Darbar Khan was actually Akbar's most cherished Kissa Khan, and his command over Persian acquired him a mansab, a rank of 700. We can also confirm the popularity of Persian classics such as Saydi's Gulistan at the Mughal court by studying the influence of these works on paintings. 
paintings and aesthetics are a very important source for us to understand the past. A lot of times, the subtleties found in these works add nuance to our understanding of history. This is another discussion that I want to take up in the podcast, and it will most probably be next week with a very celebrated art historian. Anyway, back to Persian. So this text, Gulistan, Rose Garden. This was written in Shiraz by Saidi in the 13th century and it gained popularity because of its beautiful prose. So this text, scenes from this text, scenes from Gulistan were visually translated and court artists like Govardhan, active two generations later under Shah Jahan, illustrated the opening scene of the book. These paintings would carry Persian inscriptions, but a lot of times would not give very vivid details of what was being portrayed. This possibly means that Persian tales were so widely celebrated that just visual depiction was enough sometimes to communicate the story to the observer. So you see, in this context, Persian is really at this point of time emerging as a very efficient language, a very cherished language. Richard Eaton says that Persian emerged as this unproblematic, neutral language of everyday correspondence, literary expression and social mobility. And there was this uniform idiom of Persian and there were no regional diversities or variants of it, so it made it a very easy language too. And and given all of this context, Akbar goes ahead and he declares Persian to be the language in which all administrative tasks had to be conducted. So for this, more Iranians were recruited to write records and all Mughal papers, imperial orders, farmans, bonds, acceptance letters, notices, etc. had to now be written in Persian. Its transformation to the political language of the court also encouraged indigenous groups to be well-versed in Persian, aspiring to attain the profiles of clerks, secretaries, that is, munshi, and accountants at the court. Due to the growing demand for a working knowledge of Persian, Akbar also goes ahead and makes some reforms in the schooling systems. So you begin to see that maktabs, the village schools, they begin to introduce Persian to scribal castes and kayastha children, that is children of the traditional writing scribe caste. They begin to acquire the knowledge of accounting, siyaki, from the age of four. And they also begin to learn ethics, aklak, from texts like aklak Nasiri. And the students were to understand the good and bad in human beings, proper etiquettes and code of conduct. Thus, Persian literature also becomes a medium to ensure a student's all-round development at this point of time. These students were also expected to memorize Persian couplets and moral phrases. The maktab syllabi also included Persian classics like Gulistan, which introduced kayasthas to Persianate norms and encouraged them to adopt Persian pen names. You know, many of these kayasthas would go on to become land registrars and village accountants. And Eaton affirms that due to their facility in Persian, kayasthas also served as news writers, revenue reporters, petition writers, surveyors, or even court readers. So you can see how becoming the language of the administration allowed Persian to have a widespread influence and give people a reason to begin learning, speaking, and working in it. After Akbar had made Persian the sole language for all levels of the Mughal bureaucracy, word books called nisabs, you know, simplified dictionaries interpreting Persian words for Hindavi speakers, these books began to proliferate. These texts were widely read by children of scribal castes and they were vital for their early socialization with the Mughal world. New subjects had been introduced to train people to become proper scribes in the court. Subjects like draftsmanship, letter writing were taught since this was an important quality for those who wanted to acquire the role of issuing farmans and becoming munshis. Those who were well informed in the art of draftsmanship could become munshis. So, for example, you have Harkarindas Kambhu of Multan who was a Hindu munshi whose craft became an example for later munshis. There were a number of prerequisites, however, if individuals wanted to become munshis. So you had to be a master at accountancy. You were supposed to be well-versed with revenue management. You were expected to have really good draftsmanship skills, insha, so that the position of the Mughals was not compromised. 
in the training of the munshis then to master the ilmi insha the knowledge of letter writing became a central goal they mastered the skill of drafting different types of persian letters and you see the there is this text written in 1670 or 1671 the nigar mamai munshi this book lists out how letters were to be written drafted by munshis for princes of royal blood or for nobles or for divans so this craft of letter writing really becomes very important this craft of letter writing in persian and abul fazl who was akbar's premier chronicler and as already discussed wrote his histories in persian he was known for his mastery over letter writing and his works on insha go on to become essential readings for students now in the training of a munshi great emphasis was given to a wide variety of persian texts which as muzaffar alam and sanjay subramaniam point out ranged from works on state craft accountancy histories chronicles and poetries so you have this man called chandrabhan who was a munshi considered to be as good as abul fazl he was born under during the reign of akbar and he was active under jahangir and shah jahan he wrote a letter to his son on how to master the craft of a munshi and he wrote an exhaustive list of persian texts he would have to read since those works were necessary and would render his language elegant and and they would provide him with the knowledge of the world and its inhabitants and also be of use in the assemblies of the learned so all of these qualities of persian were highlighted and due to the need for the munshis to acquire this persian knowledge sources had to be made available to them and thus it is believed that every bookseller in agra delhi and lahore had manuscript anthologies of persian poetry so with time as more individuals mastered the craft of persian newer developments occurred for example hindu masters whose insha was chosen to be a part of the persian curriculum also began to teach students over the course of the next few centuries accountancy and draftsmanship departments were mostly occupied by persian speaking kayastha munshis and by the 17th and 18th century many of them authored authoritative persian lexicons So you see through the utilization of a language known for its uniformity and accessibility appropriating it to establish a logical connection with Mughal political ideology using it to bind together a highly heterogeneous population and by transforming its learning into a craft that would assure financial gain Persian emerged as the most significant language under Akbar and was able to linguistically connect a very diverse empire. Now, before I let all of you go, I have to give all of you a very exciting announcement. I'm happy to announce that we are now accepting entries for the Ethiology Journal scheduled to be released later this year. We are the first of a kind independent youth led platform that strives to make Indian history accessible inclusive and engaging. So the aim of the Ethiology Journal is to give space to students and aspiring academicians who have a penchant for the Indian past and want to shed light on histories they are fascinated by. We encourage fresh insights and new arguments on themes of historical interest. Our objective is to make the field of Indian history wider in its scope and we are committed to curating a platform where the voices of students emerge. So if you wish to get published in the first volume of the Ethiology Journal, send your abstracts to ethiasjournal@gmail.com by 12th June 2021. More information will be available on our Instagram page at the rate ethiology, so don't forget to check that out. Also another exciting thing that's going to happen on the 12th of June 2021 is that Kudrat Singh who is the content head at Ethiology and I both of us are going to host a virtual museum walk called Stories in Sculptures. This is going to be a very exciting walk taking all of you through the various collections of sculptures that are hosted by the National Museum in New Delhi, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the Cleveland Museum of Art in Cleveland and many other museums. and this is actually a rerun of a walk that we conducted at the national museum physically so we're doing this rerun because we can't get out of our houses right now but we can bring the museum to you so if you're interested in signing up go to our instagram page adrit ethiology you'll find all the relevant information there 
Thank you, everyone. I hope all of you enjoyed this class and learned something interesting and new. As I mentioned in the beginning, this was the first episode of Ithyas Shala. In this series, I will be simplifying topics from Indian history for students, learners, or anybody who is curious to know more. I will also be inviting scholars and historians on board to discuss with them their areas of specialization and to even answer questions that you may have. So if you want to suggest a topic or have a question from Indian history that you want simplified, then you can send us an email on ethyasology at the rate gmail.com or send us a direct message on Instagram at the rate ethyasology. Thank you once again for watching. I'm your host, Eric Chopra, signing off. Thank you.